Hello, I'm Ryan. And I'm Brody. And this is the High Volatility Experience. Hey Ryan, we're back this week, and I have some bad news. I am going on vacation. Now, it's a faraway place, and it's about 340,000 feet in the air. That's right. I'm going to space, and I'm excited. I'm going to be there for a little bit, but it's okay. I'm going to come back, and it's going to be good, and we can get back to the high volatility. But for now, I want to talk about space, because it's a really wild world. Where do we start? Let's start on October 4th, 1957, when the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik 1. This was the first unmanned mission into space ever documented, and it changed the future possibilities of space exploration forever. Without the need for humans on craft, the costs for missions are cheaper, it is less dangerous as there is no risk for the loss of human life, and the crafts can be sent to places humans cannot yet go. Now, go into the future almost 65 years, and here we are in 2021. Private companies now like SpaceX and Blue Origin are really looking into space exploration, as opposed to something that was only done by national governments and government-funded projects. It was only in 2004 that the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act required the legalization of private space flight by NASA and the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA. So that refreshes all the history on space travel and what we have up till now. But as of a few days ago, the whole industry changed. Traveling to space for the simple purpose of recreation is slowly but surely becoming a reality. Blue Origin, a private aerospace manufacturer and provider of suborbital space flight services, is launching a tourism rocket on July 20th. New Shepard, the name of Blue Origin ship, will hold six tourists up to 340,000 feet, like me, for a few minutes and then return to Earth. The first ticket was reportedly sold for 2.6 million. So this is significant because it will definitely have large implications for future space travel and into the industry of space tourism. Blue Origin is the first to offer space tourism, but it will certainly not be the last. For example, the stock price of Virgin Galactic, or ticker VG for short, a company leading the development of space tourism, has shot up 54% in the past five days. Most of it is thanks to the FAA approving Virgin Galactic's passenger spaceflight license. And this license guarantees that VG will be able to fly passengers on their future rockets to space. Obviously, this is a tremendous step as the process is incredibly rigorous to pass through. Michael Sheets at CNBC writes, quote, The company completed a 29-element verification and validation program for the FAA clearing the final two FAA milestones with its most recent spaceflight test in May. Now this all sounds great. However, it's only half the battle. A ticket for a Virgin Galactic spaceflight was priced at 250000 per seat in 2020. But... Almost 600 people had already signed up. I don't know about you, but you can buy almost 17,068 ounce bottles of olive oil for that money. Or, you know, a nice house, whatever. Demand is definitely something Virgin will have to tackle to be successful. In the first quarter of 2020, the company lost $60 million, and it only had a revenue of 238000 which came from engineering services. The issue with space tourism is that with the crazy price tag, you're severely limiting your targeted demographic. Not to say there's any option given how expensive operating expenses and rocket fuel are. Now, speaking of rocket fuel, let's just take a quick detour onto some of the environmental externalities that are caused by space travel. Eloise Moroy and Associate Professor of Physical Geography at the University College of London states that the heat released from the rocket causes nitrogen in the atmosphere to turn into nitrogen oxides. These have the possibility of being damaging to the environment as they can deplete the ozone layer. What else is there, Brody? 
Well, as we talked about before, space travel usually creates a lot of hazards to the environment. However, an article written by Wall Street Journal, albeit in 2014, states the FAA estimates that Virgin Galactic's fully reusable Spaceship 2 passenger spacecraft will take you to space and back, leaving a carbon footprint of just 0.28 tons. This is far less than a round trip from LA to New York on a plane. So, this is Virgin Galactic's take on environmentally friendly space travel. But what about the other companies, right? Well, this is an interesting question because I actually couldn't find statements by Blue Origin about the environmental impacts of their rockets or spacecrafts. But in 2014, the FAA did lead a supplemental environment assessment that addressed the potential environmental impacts of issuing experimental permits or launch licenses to Blue Origin for the, quote, operation of various suborbital launch vehicles at Blue Origin's West Texas launch site. After reviewing this proposed action, the FAA has concluded that these operations by Blue Origin would not significantly impact the quality of the human environment. However, granted again, these were statements issued in 2014, and things could very well have changed. So in conclusion, as of now, space tourism has yet to be experienced, but that will change very soon. It will be a learning moment for everyone involved, and everything will need to be monitored. From environmental effects to overall demand for the service being offered, it all needs to be experienced and learned from so that we can move forward. So this is space tourism, but what do we have next on space? Next, we move on to China. Haven't talked about them in a while, right? And the 21st century space race. Just last Thursday, China revealed their plans to send humans to Mars and build a base at a space exploration conference. China's leading rocket producer stated that they will be launching the first manned mission to Mars in 2033. So recently, China has also released a video footage with sound captured by its rover, Zhurong, which is China's first rover to land on another planet. Up until now, the U.S. has had been the only country to successfully land a rover on Mars. So this is a massive achievement, not only for the Chinese, but for international growth in space overall. To work off of what Brody just said, for perspective, NASA has only ever sent a total of five rovers to Mars, and from a total of 12 total landing attempts, only eight have been successful. And NASA has the best track record. This speaks to not only the financial challenges and traveling logistics of exploring Mars like we talked about earlier, but more into the technical difficulties of landing a rover on Mars, which obviously carries over to human missions, if we ever do that. According to NASA's Mars Exploration Program historical log from 1960 to 2020, there were 23 failures in 48 total worldly attempts related to Mars exploration missions. Now think of the risk of adding humans into the mix of missions, bringing the longevity cost of travel coupled with fuel resources. But why is it so difficult to land something on Mars? According to Fizz.org, there are things that make landing a craft on Mars difficult, include Mars's atmosphere and Mars's distance from us. The atmosphere on Mars is much more thin than it is on Earth. On Earth, the friction provided by the atmosphere during an object's entry into the atmosphere is enough to slow down the object, enough for a parachute to land safely. On Mars, however, with the thinner atmosphere, the rocket won't be able to slow down enough during its descent through Mars's atmosphere for a parachute to help it at all. Thus, landers have to use retro rockets, or rockets that provide thrust in the opposite direction of the object that is falling towards Mars, which would slow the rocket down. However, this brings problems as well, because the counterthrust can generate so much turbulence that it could destroy the spaceship. Furthermore, as with any frictional force, the craft burns up as they enter the atmosphere. So, the danger's there, but what else is with Earth and Mars, Ryan? Well, the other factor is the distance between Earth and Mars. Mars distance doesn't simply reference the distance between the Earth and Mars in terms of travel period, but also technological challenges that come with insane amounts of distance. 
Because Mars is so far away, scientists and engineers cannot send immediate commands to a craft, so instead a meticulous sequence of actions have to be programmed prior to the landing on Mars. Thus, during the approximately seven minutes that it takes for a craft to land on Mars, starting from the entry phase at the top of Mars' atmosphere into the descent phase, and finally the landing phase, scientists and engineers have no control over the path the craft takes, and this has been dubbed as the seven minutes of terror. So, going back to China's Mars rover, as of June 27th, the China National Space Agency has said that the rover has traveled 236 meters in 42 souls, or Martian days. One Martian day is 24 hours and 39 minutes. The China rover landed on Mars on May 14th this year in Utopia Plantea, which is the largest recognized impact basin on Mars, and is planned in terrain in the northern hemisphere. All in all, after all this progress, it's important to look at what China's main goal of Mars development is. What they want to do is to create a large-scale development of Mars's resources. Essentially take China and make it all of Mars, if possible. And then maintain that presence on the red planet. This is all from Wang Shaozheng, the head of state-owned China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, and who oversees much of China's space program. China's development of space technology has certainly been interesting, but it has proven dangerous. As some of us may remember, the China rocket situation, as Twitter named it, just last month, China tested one of its rockets, but one of the boosters failed, leading to it not clearing into space. The booster orbited for an ex unexpected time, and it resulted in the booster falling back to the Earth in an incalculable position. Luckily, the rocket landed in the Indian Ocean, but many were fearful of a couple million pound object falling towards them at a rate of knots. And imagine if humans had been along board, right? So far, we have only discussed and developed the theoretical on what nations and companies want to happen with space. However, life usually doesn't play out that way, and it's usually never according to theory. In an article written by Issam Ahmed and Lucy Alborg at fizz.org notes a few issues that come with visiting the Red Planet. What are they? So, earlier we talked about the rocket fuel, not only the environmental impacts, we haven't even talked about rocket fuel cost, which becomes very expensive very quickly. We also talked about the logistics of trying to land a craft on Mars. But you also have to consider keeping the humans alive on craft during the travel. In order to travel to Mars, astronauts will cover a distance of 140 million miles, which will take months. Now the logistics of this becomes unthinkable very quickly. Astronauts obviously have to be kept healthy and fed. NASA says that astronauts on the ISS bring up to 24,000 pounds of food for a three-year stay in space. Now, according to Pascal Lee, the director of the Mars Institute, a nonprofit research group that is partially funded by NASA, said that a human mission to Mars could cost up to $1 trillion in the next 25 years. Now, for comparison, NASA's fiscal year 2020 budget was about $22.6 billion. Now, what's interesting is that space tourism may actually reduce costs for the future because the market might be pretty narrow right now, but it's certainly expanding, and there's just that much more room for technological development and advancement for ventures like space tourism and travel that will decrease future costs. So, actually, to add to the point about decreasing future costs, we can compare this to the history of personal computers, where in the past, before everyone made laptops, only a few places were making personal computers and everything like that. But then, as the innovation grew and the industry overall expanded, more companies got in there and they were able to innovate and make personal computers less expensive. We might see this with the space travel and space tourism industry. As more companies get in, things will become cheaper, and I can go to space for less than $250,000 or $2.6 million, depending on which spaceship I'm on. So today we've talked about space tourism, 
and overall the space race to Mars and everything. But that about wraps it up. And all I have to say is I'll bring you back our moon rock, Ryan, and we'll be back next week. Not me, but you will. We'll see all of you guys later.